So this right here is the location of where the Sauter family lived and the Sauter children disappeared. They do have a no trespassing sign and several signs that make it very clear they don't want people here. So we don't want to necessarily, you know, cause any disruptions, but we did want to show you the location. Right here is where the fire occurred. 1945, Christmas Eve. So this is the back side of the house. You can kind of see a little chimney right there. I don't know what that goes to though. But this is where it happened in 1945, but it was way too loud here. For decades, anyone driving down Route 16 near Fayetteville, West Virginia, could see a billboard bearing the grainy images of five children, all dark-haired and solemn-eyed. Their names and ages, Maurice, 14, Martha, 12, Louis, 9, Jenny, 8, and Betty, 5. Wrote as well was speculation about what might have happened to them. Numerous stories, videos, and articles have been done on the Sauter family mystery. No one can agree, and rumor plays a heavier role than evidence in some cases. So let's start with what we do know, and what might have happened to the Sauter children. What we do know is it was Christmas Eve in 1945. The Sauter family was a very close unit, and there's a slight cloud on the house, and everyone's mood was a little down because one of them couldn't be there on Christmas Eve. Joseph, one of the sons, was supposed to be home from the military, but he couldn't make it. As the parents decided to go to bed because they're tired, some of the children asked to stay up a little bit longer and play and listen to the radio, talk, you know. Around 1 a.m. a fire broke out. George and Jenny and four of their children escaped, but the other five were never seen again. George had tried to save them. He broke a window to re-enter the house, slicing his arm open. He couldn't see anything through the smoke and fire which had swept through the downstairs, living room and dining room, kitchen, office, and him and Jenny's bedroom. He frantically began to see who was out and who was not. He took account for two-year-old Sylvia, whose crib was in their bedroom at the time. She was safe outside, as was 17-year-old Marion, and two sons, 23-year-old John and 16-year-old George Jr. They had fled from the upstairs bedroom they shared, singeing their hair on the way out, barely making it. So he figured that Maurice, Martha, Louis, Jenny, and Betty still had to be up there, cowering somewhere in the bedrooms or in the hallway, separated by the staircase, which was now engulfed in flames. He raced back outside, knowing he was running out of time, hoping to reach them through the upstairs windows, but the ladder that he always kept propped against the house was strangely missing. An idea struck him. He would drive one of his two cold trucks up to the house and climb on top of it to reach one of the windows, but even though they functioned perfectly the day before, neither of them would start now. He began to frantically figure out another option. He tried to scoop water from the rain barrel, but it was frozen solid. It was winter. Five of his children were stuck somewhere inside that house filled with smoke and flames. What was he going to do? Marion sprinted to a neighbor's home to call the Fayetteville Fire Department, but couldn't get any operator response. A neighbor who saw the blaze made a call from a nearby tavern, but again, no operator responded. Completely over the situation, the neighbor drove into town and tracked down Fire Chief F.J. Morris, who initiated Fayetteville's version of a fire alarm. It was called a phone tree system, where one firefighter phoned another, who phoned another, and on and on. The fire department was only two and a half hours away, but the crew didn't arrive till 8 a.m., by which that point the Sodders' home had been reduced to a smoking pile of ash and all hope was gone. The five children were not there. 
George and Jenny assumed that the five of their children were dead, but after a brief search of the grounds on Christmas Day, turned up no trace of their remains. Chief Morris suggested that the blaze had been hot enough to completely cremate the bodies. A state police inspector combed the rubble and attributed the fire to faulty wiring. George covered the basement with five feet of dirt, intending to preserve the site as a memorial. The coroner's office issued five death certificates just before the new year, attributing the causes to fire or suffocation. But now the Sodders began to wonder. They had a gnawing pit in their stomach. Were their children still alive? Or at least when they left the house? Or at least were they alive the night they disappeared? The Sodders planted flowers across the space where their house had stood and Jenny actually tended to those flowers the rest of her life. But shortly after the children disappeared, they began to stitch together a series of odd things leading up to the fire. One was a stranger who appeared at the home a few months earlier, back in the fall, asking about work. He kind of meandered to the back of the house, pointed to two separate fuse boxes and said, you know, this is going to cause a fire someday strange George thought especially since he had just had the wiring checked by the local power company which said it was completely fine and in good condition around the same time another man tried to sell the family life insurance and he became really mad when George declined your damn house is gonna go up in smoke he warned and you're gonna lose your children and everything's gonna be destroyed can you imagine someone saying that to you by the way <laughs> he also added and you're gonna pay for your dirty remarks you've been making about Mussolini George was indeed outspoken about his dislike for the Italian dictator. George was born and raised in Italy, occasionally engaging in heating arguments with other members of Fayetteville's Italian community, and at the time, he didn't take the man's threats very seriously. The older Sauter sons also recalled something peculiar. Just before Christmas, they noticed a man parked along US Highway 21 intently watching the younger kids as they came home from school. Around 12.30 Christmas morning, after the children had opened a few presents and everyone had gone to sleep, the telephone rang. Jenny rushed to answer it. An unfamiliar female voice asked for an unknown name. There was a bunch of laughter and glasses clinking in the background. Jenny said, you have the wrong number and hung up, went going back to bed. She noticed all the downstairs lights were still on and the curtains were open. The front door was unlocked. She saw Marion asleep on the sofa in the living room and assumed that the other kids were upstairs in bed by this time. She turned out the lights, closed the curtains, locked the door, and returned to her bedroom. She had just begun to doze off when she heard a sharp, loud bang on the roof and then a rolling noise. An hour later, she was woken again, this time by the heavy smoke coming into her room. Jenny could not understand how her five children could perish in the fire and leave no bones, nothing, nothing behind at all. She conducted private experiments by herself, burning animal bones, chicken bones, beef joints, pork chop bones, to see if the fire consumed them. Each time, she was left with a heap of charred bones. How could you get around this? How could all five children not leave anything? An employee at the crematorium informed her that bones remain after bodies are burned for two hours at 2,000 degrees. The house was destroyed in 45 minutes. The collection of odd things began to grow. A telephone repairman told the Sodders that their lines appeared to have been cut, not burned. They realized that if the fire had been electrical, the result of faulty wiring, as the official report had stated, then the power would have been dead, so why were the downstairs lights on? A witness finally came forward claiming he saw a man at the fire scene taking a block and tackle used for removing car engines. Could he be the reason George's truck didn't start? One day while the family while visit was visiting the site, Sylvia found a hard rubber object in the yard. Jenny recalled hearing the hard thud on the roof and the rolling sound. George concluded it was a napalm or a pineapple bomb, kind of the type that you use in woke warfare. Then came the reports of sightings. A woman claimed to have seen the missing children peering from a passing car while the fire was in progress. Also a woman operating a tourist stop between Fayetteville and Charleston, about 50 miles west, said she saw the children the morning after the fire. 
Yes, I served them breakfast, she told the police. I, I remember them vividly. There was a car with Florida license plates. A woman at a Charleston hotel saw the children's photos in the newspaper and said she had seen four of the five about a week after the fire. The children were accompanied by two women and two men, all of Italian descent, she said in a statement. I do not remember the exact date, however, the entire party did register at the hotel and stayed in a large room with several beds. They came in about midnight. I tried to talk to the children in a friendly manner, but the men appeared hostile and refused to allow me to talk to these kids, and this is why it stood out in her head. One of the men looked at me with anger. He turned around and began talking rapidly in Italian. Then the whole party stopped talking to me. I sensed I was being sort of froze out, so I said nothing more. They left very early the next morning. So the Sodders turned to a private investigator named Tinsley who discovered the insurance salesman who had threatened George was a member of the coroner's jury that deemed the fire accidental. He also heard a curious story from the Fayetteville minister about F.J. Morris, the fire chief. Although Morris had claimed no remains were found, he supposedly confided that he discovered a heart in the ashes and he hid it in a box, buried it at the scene, which is really weird. <laughs> Tinsley persuaded Morris to show them the spot. Together they dug up the box, took it to a local funeral director who poked and prodded the heart and concluded it was a beef liver, untouched by the fire, pretty much placed there afterwards. Soon, the Sodders heard rumors that the fire chief had told others that the content of the box had not been found in the fire at all, that he'd buried the beef liver in the rubble in hope of finding any remains would put the family at ease to stop the investigation and stop the craziness. Over the next few years, the tips and leads continued to come. George saw a newspaper photo of the school children in a New York City paper and was convinced one of them was his daughter Betty. He drove all the way to Manhattan to search for Betty, but, his pa but her parents refused to speak to him. In August 1949, the Sodders decided to mount a new search at the fire scene. They brought in a Washington, D.C. pathologist. Excavation was thorough, uncovering several small objects, damaged coins, a partially burned dictionary, and several shards of a vertebrae. He sent the bones to the Smithsonian Institute, and this is what the report said. The human bones consist of four lumbar vertebrae belonging to one individual. The age of this individual at death should be between 16 and 17 years old. The top limit of age should be 22. The vertebrae showed no evidence that they were exposed to fire. The report said it is very strange that no other bones were found in this allegedly careful excavation of the basement of the house. It said that one would expect to find full skeletons of the five children, not just only for vertebrae. The report concluded it was most likely the bones, the vertebrae, was found in the supply of dirt that George used to fill the basement to create the memorial for his children, which opens up more questions. <laughs> Who'd that spine belong to? George and Jenny erected a billboard along Route 16 and passed out flyers offering a $5,000 reward for information leading to the recovery of their children. They soon increased this amount to 10000 a letter arrived from a woman in St. Louis saying the oldest girl, Martha, was in a convent there. Another tip came from Texas, where someone in a bar overheard an incriminating conversation about a long-ago Christmas Eve fire in West Virginia. Someone in Florida claimed the children were staying with a distant relative of Jenny's. George traveled the country to investigate each lead, but always returned home without any answers. In 1968, more than 20 years after the fire, Jenny went to the mail and found an envelope addressed to just her. It was postmarked in Kentucky and it had no return address. Inside was a photo of a man in his mid-twenties. On the flip side was a cryptic handwritten note. Louis Sauter, I love my brother Frankie. She and George couldn't deny the resemblance to their Louis, who was nine at the time of the fire. Beyond the obvious similarities, dark curly hair, dark brown eyes, they had the same straight nose, the same upward tilt to the left eyebrow, the same mouth. Once again, they hired a private detector and sent him to Kentucky. The detective disappeared. They never heard from him again. The youngest and last surviving solder child, Sylvia, 
who was 69 at the time that they interviewed her. She doesn't believe her siblings perished in the fire. When time permits, she visits crime sleuthing websites and engages with people still interested in this mystery. Her very first memories are of that night in 1945 when she was two years old. She said she'll never forget the sight of her father bleeding or the terrible cries and screams from her family. She's carried it forever and she always will. And she is no closer to understanding why this happened. So we aren't going to solve this mystery today, no more than anyone else has, but we can add our opinion. So no pun intended, but where there is smoke, there is fire. There's fires all over the world that people know their loved ones died in, and there's no nagging voice telling you something is off, something is wrong, your family's still alive. The children didn't die in that fire. Someone either was pissed off or wanted to extort the family and kind of chickened out at the last minute. Maybe the kids were then killed, or did they grow up somewhere else? That part we don't know. It seems more likely because they sort of just vanished and they could have got back in touch with their family at some points, you know, as adults, that they probably were killed. But there's just too many things that point to the fact that the kids didn't die that night in that fire. The parents knew it in their souls instinctually. You feel that. You can feel those sort of things when someone's still alive or when something's wrong, especially with your children and your blood. I feel like most likely they were killed later to get rid of possible punishments once the case got hot and heavy. But we'll never know, I think. But today we can visit George and Jenny and show our respect. No one should have to live with that pain forever, and hopefully they're all together now. So we're at the High Lawn Cemetery in Oak Hill, West Virginia, about 13 minutes from the house where the Sodders lived. And this is the Sodder children's parents. Michael Sodder, December 30th, 1951. To December 30th, 1951. Well, Michael Sauter is on here too, so they must have had a, another baby after the fire. Sons in a bad position. <sighs> in the memory of George Sauter, 1895 to 1969, and Jenny, 1903 to 1989, who believe, who believeth in justice for everyone, but was denied justice by the law when his five children were kidnapped Christmas Eve. 1945 at Fayetteville, West Virginia. George Sauter was born Giorgio 
Pseudo in Sardinia, 1895. He then immigrated to the United States in 1908 when he was 13. An older brother who accompanied him to Ellis Island immediately returned to Italy, leaving George on his own, and he found work in Pennsylvania railroads carrying water and supplies to laborers. And after a few years, he moved to Smithers, West Virginia. He eventually married his wife, Jenny, and they had 10 children between 1923 and 1943. They settled in here in Fayetteville, an Appalachian town with a small but active Italian immigrant community. Jenny was also born in Italy. She was one of five children. But today we just want to speak their names and visit them for a little bit. Because in reality, that's all we can do. Rest in peace, George and Jenny. I'm sorry that you didn't find your children. But I hope you're all together now. <laughs>